taken into the open arms of a very corrupt world. And if you speak out against it in any kind of way, like Sister Rachel's testimony was, there you have what could happen. But I commend that individual for saying, no, I've got to make a stand. And continuing right on with 1 Thessalonians, I'm going to do chapter 4 tonight. There is some things mentioning in here, and it, it gets an idea of staying away from sin. Yes, I know it gets into some, uh, in some areas, pretty specific things. But for the most part tonight, and it was like a conversation that I had had earlier this morning. You know, it's, and we went over and over and over and over again, even in here. God does not set any sin. Any, you know, we were talking about it, you know, it's a little lie, innocent lie that just was to trying to keep from getting in trouble that it can be told is no different in the eyes of God than killing somebody. Now we in our mind, oh my goodness, that killing somebody, that's just such a high level. That's just so much more extensive. That's just so much worse than just telling a lie. A lie wouldn't hurt anybody. But never, not one time, have you ever seen, either in your life, either in Scripture, or either in someone else's life, have you ever seen sin that is not put in check, that doesn't come with some greater repercussions somewhere down the road. And they seem like it's a ripple effect in water. It may start with one light little tap, but the further that it goes, you know, and someone, well, someone put it this way the other day as far as lying goes, it says, well, when you tell one lie, you have to tell another lie to hold that lie up. And then it works its way up. you got to tell another lie to hold those two up. And it gets really and truly kind of exhausting with someone trying to keep their stories lined up in their lie when all the time, would it not have just been so much easier to have just told the truth to start with and carry it on with the world? Carry on with your life. If it had hurt someone's feelings, I, ain't, I don't mean to sound hard-hearted when I say they'll get over it, but when two parties are willing to set their pride aside, set their egos to the side, and begin to actually talk, we were talking the other day, we, we were sitting there at lunch today, and I'm not kidding, for 10 straight minutes, and if you've watched television for any length of time, you know I'm telling the truth, there was non-stop. There was this person's political ad, then there was the next one's political ad, then after that was the next one's political ad, then after that was... We, it went on for so long, we started making a game of it. We started trying to guess who was going to be next. So, well, that was playing right now, producing me next. Oh, I got that one wrong. Well, okay, when he goes off, they're going to have so-and-so. And it would sometimes, I got two of them back-to-back -back right, and I've bragged about that all day. But I was trying to tell them I didn't go buy me a lottery ticket now. I, done, I told which commercial was coming on before it ever came on, so I was doing pretty good. But if someone spoke up in the, right there in the lunchroom and said if they would all just put their egos aside, actually sit down, do their job, worry about what they actually claim to be worrying about, we wouldn't have to be sitting here looking at all this mess just constantly being bombarded. But just in the same way that you know we're getting bombarded with those ads and different things, we are bombarded every day, volley after volley after volley, the devil constantly trying to tempt us to fall into some kind of sin because like Sister Kathy said just a moment ago, the devil knows all too well that his time is running out. Now, we know we've been saying that for a long time. Preachers have been saying that since before even I was born. That the end's coming, you know, God's fixing to come back. You know, I, just, I don't feel like it's going to be long. But we're really beginning to see a lot of things happen very, very rapidly. It seems like one prophecy after the other is just like a domino effect. It's just this is coming through and that's coming through. And, and I'm not going to try to get into that because I, I'm not, you know, we're going to stick with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 tonight. 
But one thing we want to make sure that we're doing in this while we're trying to, 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 to keep our shield up, you know, we keep our armor on, we keep our, we, you know, keep remembering that there's no kind of weapon that we can ever wield physically that's ever going to help us fight or to help us get through this world, through this life. We need the Holy Ghost. We need it to keep us to keep us in check because if, you know, anything everywhere, anything that you look at, you know, whether it's a car motor or maybe it's some kind of toy to a, a kid's toy that's some, got some kind of moving parts to it, it's going to have some sort of level of a control on it. A bicycle for a, a period of time is going to have training wheels on it. A tricycle's got all three wheels on it because a child that's small enough to be riding on that tricycle isn't ready to be riding around on a two-wheel bike. Now, some get on those bikes with the training wheels and they take to it like a fish to water and it's not long, you can knock the training wheels off. But what I'm looking at and telling you about when we talk about we needing the Holy Ghost to keep us, we're talking about a training wheel that's never going to come off. We're talking about things that God has in place for you and me to have with us at all times, scripture out of his word, memories of, of maybe messages being preached or lessons that were taught, and, and, and remembering how to, you know, you can, you can refer back to those when you need them to get you through certain times in life, certain, you know, days. Sometimes we have days that just seem like things won't quit, not necessarily like my day today. It's just kind of been an emotional roller coaster. You know, if they going, day was good. I can't complain too much about the day. But then we went into, I walked outside, got had a free moment, checked my phone, and got a text message that completely turned everything upside down. And just went on through the day with that. Then towards the end of the day, said goodbye to a co-worker. And, and it was just kind of an emotional thing. And, and it's, you know, they're, they're moving on. And it's, sometimes you hate to see things like that happen, but... You know, I've kind of made up my mind when a situation like that is, if you plan on sticking around somewhere very long, you're going to see people come and go. Some may be a little bit easier to see go than others, but every once in a while, like today was, it just was a little harder to actually see, it, see them, you know, tell everybody goodbye. And, and yeah, we kind of threw COVID out the window. And they were some hugs was going on and just saying, you know, Good luck to you. I hope everything works out great, but hate to see you go. Well, and later on, and I, you know, someone finally looked up and said, y'all are acting like they died. Well, before they came here, how many times have you ever met seen them? Well, I never did. Well, guess how many times you're probably going to see them now? You never will. And later on in this chapter, it does begin to talk about death and, and a way to approach death and a way to look at it. But I don't want to get too far ahead of the chapter. I'm fixing to quit rambling and actually start reading here. And uh, But 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting with the first verse. We'll read from 1 through 8. Right now it says, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk, and to please God, that should be the number one goal that we have every day in our lives, to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in the lust of concuspience, the even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us to uncleanliness, but to holiness. He therefore that despiseth despiseth not man, but God, who has also given unto us his Holy Spirit. <laughs> and we're looking and trying to figure out how we can see how, can we figure out how things have gotten where they are today. We see ourselves in a society today when even it's even gotten easier for Christians to overlook or even even tolerate, and, and, and I've spoken on that before, how slippery of a slope that is to tolerate 
um, immoral behaviors or for tonight. You know, it seems like a lot of people are trying to get away from ever using the word sin. You know, it's just too touchy of a, of a situation. It's too touchy of a topic. It doesn't create the right reaction when really and truly it creates the perfect reaction. It creates conviction. And, when you, and we go over that a lot of times and talking about how it's what people are doing with that conviction, what their response to that conviction is that's really causing the problem. But see, whatever sin that you may you, you may you overlook or tolerate is a very dangerous thing, a slippery slope as I wanted to put it, because what you tolerate today, you find yourself embracing tomorrow. Or, or just completely giving a free pass. You know, greed, drunkenness, uh, gossip, just things that sometimes we overlook because we want to only focus on what we call the big sins. While, you know, thinking of how one Christian may look at something like that, you know, greed, drunkenness, gossip, something like that, they shrug it off like it's nothing, but that same Christian can just absolutely loses their minds and becomes outraged when somebody begins to talk about homosexuality or extortion or murder and different things like that, then they just want to lose their minds. Well, where is the difference in them? Well, we can't really think of how we're going to condone sin in any way. We can't do that. We have to make a stand and say no. You know, and... I know I just said this the other day. I told the story, but I got into you know, the little text message from somebody. Hey, this is so-and-so. I have no idea who they are. I have no idea how they got my phone number. But they wanted to know, was I going to vote for this person in the, the, on January 5th? Was I going to support them? And I said, no, I am not. And they said, well, well you know, they didn't say why not, which I thought that was going to be their next their question. Their next question was, to me, kind of a dumb question when they said, well, who are you going to support? Well, if I'm not going to support one, kind of goes to tell you I'm going to support the other one, but I simply responded with, I'm going to support Jesus. Yes. And they may be thinking, well, how in the world could you be doing that? He's not on the ballot. Well, I'm picking and choosing the ones that I think yes. more closely. No, they don't. Neither one of them follow this word to a T. But the one that I can figure out from what I've had to do and what I've had to study and what I can think of because I don't want to condone sin. I don't want to elect somebody or put my name, their name on my ballot that I know they're going to be for abortion. If they're for that, I can't help them at all. Right. Even a Christian, and not even a biblical thing, my conscience alone, I can't do it. Somebody who talks about hurting a baby... And I've said this before, and I've said right on. If you've got one that you don't want and you can't keep, call me. I'll come get the young. Because I don't ever could figure out how someone could think that baby is not a living human being. Okay, I know there's other things that I can get into, but if there's any support of... I don't want that my name on them because I can't in good conscience say, well, hey, I'm living my life this way. I'm living my life to be what I think the Scripture is telling me to do. I'm trying to, verse 1, I'm trying to walk and to please God so that I can abound more and more, so that I can grow more and more in Him every day. Yes. So that when I get down on my knees and I pray and I begin to call on the Lord, it's not a, 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 a years and years ago I kind of mentioned that about how I wonder if sometimes when we, we, we kneel down and pray and maybe it's been a long time since we've done it. You ever look at the number on your cell phone and wonder who in the world is this? Because you haven't seen the number in so long. You know, I know now if you've got them saved in your contacts, you know who it is. But still, you ever look at your caller ID at the house? You haven't seen that number in so long. Or you answer the phone and it takes you a little while to recognize their voice because it's been so long since you've heard it. Does God ever look and say, Woo, I haven't heard from them in a long time. Or does he say, whoo, we just talked. Here you are again. You just won't leave me alone. I get four or five phone calls every day at work from different from co-workers, different departments. And I, and I find every day, and it's nine times out of ten, it's always the same one. And every time they'll come over and tell me I got a phone call, I look at the person next to and I say, if it's so-and-so, I might as well just tell them to go home. But then we go through everything, and I handle it, and I talk to them. But it's never, I, I say that, but I'm kidding, I'm joking, because that's what I'm there for, to help people out when they're needing help. 
God does not ever say, good gracious, won't you just leave me alone? I'm trying to get a break. I have tried to, you know, my phone, and, and, and you know, I, and everybody, you know, the, the girls every Sunday morning when we sing Little Birdie, they're not lying when they point at me every time when they get to the part about your ace and little sleepyhead. I like my naps. If my phone's going to ring, it's going to ring just about the time I fall asleep and do a nap. And I'm talking about sometimes it's those good naps that you didn't mean to take. You just kind of sitting there watching TV, and before you know it, you start your eyes kind of get like this, and you're just about gone. Phone ring. You'll never get back to sleep the rest of the day. That'll never happen. That was a one-time opportunity, and it just passed us by. God doesn't say, what in the world do you want now? He knows that we need help. He knows that we're there. He understands of what we're trying to deal with this in our life. And it seems like it's going to get bombarded through the first part of this chapter of it's just don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. But just like God does so many times in this word, just wait till we get to the end. Sometimes we don't get, we don't allow God to finish what he's telling us before we get in our feelings and we cut him off. Sometimes we may do that in an argument. We may do that in a disagreement with somebody. We won't let them fully explain what their side of the story even was because we get, we've already gotten to that point. We have gotten upset. We're not going to let them finish what they were saying because we are right. We are always right. And there's never going to be anything to change that. And we're wondering what's happening in the world today when we get to wonder, why won't anybody listen to one another? The world won't even listen to God. What makes them think they're going to listen to each other? That's right. But they go on here and they begin to talk about how there's the God that helps us so many times in our lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, it says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? And there's a question mark right there. That is written as a question. So know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor riot, nor re revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. There ain't a person in this world that is not guilty of a sin. And such were some of you, kind of going back to a him without <laughs> sin, cast the first stone on him. But, such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Didn't we just read something right there about how he gives us his Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, verse 8. He therefore that despises, despises not man but God, who hath also yes. given unto us his Holy Spirit, the most precious gift he's ever given us. And there it is over here in 1 Corinthians being talked about again. And through that Holy Spirit, we get access yeah. To that, hey, look, there's three ways that that works. There's three aspects of how this action from God makes people. It's how it makes people change. It's how we get an opportunity to look at life through a different telescope and through a different lens. Because one number one, our sins can be washed away. With the blood that he shed on Calvary, blood that ran down that cross and pulled it up at the ground and was just began to flow from him. The sweat that he had coming off of his forehead, the wounds that he had in his side from being beaten. We have the chance because of that blood to wash our sins yes, away. Yes, come on. Uh, we have also been sanctified. We have been pronounced not guilty. Every sin that you've ever committed in your life, you have been declared not guilty from because he was the ultimate sacrifice. Yes, come on. He didn't just push them back for another year. Yes. He wiped them away. He cast yes, them as far hallelujah. as the east is from the west. 
He knew and he understood. I can't let, I know I've been harping on this a lot lately, but he said, I can't let them angels come down here and get me off come of this on. cross because if I do, it's going to avoid everything come out. On. I love them yes. too much. So I tell you what, you just forgive them because they don't realize what they have done. I'm giving them the opportunity to have forgiveness for what they've done. I'm giving the future generations the opportunity to say, yes, I lived a life that was just rambunctious. I lived a life and I was just an old scoundrel. But I can tell you what I can be tonight. I can be washed under the blood. I can be guilt free. I can know that I can lay my head down at night just like you can. And you can say whatever sin that might have been committed in my past is under the blood. I can't be held nothing to it no more as far as Scripture. I can't be held accountable for any of that. Now, because I understand that I have handed it over to God, now I've got to live my life differently. I've got to live my life to please God. I've got to walk every day in a spirit. I am now a spirit. When you receive the Holy Ghost, you are no longer you. We say now that in baptism, that is a grave. That is a, a death is taking place in baptism. The old man is dead and is set in that watery grave. What comes up is the new creature that God's going to do a work in. He's going to set it to the side so that he can do something with you. He's got a special plan for that person that comes up out of that water. And they begin to live their lives differently. They ain't living it for how high they can get. They ain't living it for how drunk they can get. They limit it for what they can do for God every single day. Glory and money. I haven't felt like this in a long time. But we understand that what God's trying to do today, it pale, the, the, the evil that we're seeing go on in the world right now pales in comparison to the power that God has. God ain't never shuddered. He ain't never shuddered. He ain't never shivered. He ain't never walked onto a battlefield and thought, you know what, I don't know if I'm going to win this one. He knew the day that he hung him on that cross, the victory was his. The three days that he was dead and he went back and he got the key. He told the devil right there, you thought you had won, but I've got an army coming. They sung the song a while ago. There's an army rising up. Yep. The only they can't be but one army. Come that on. don't make no sense. Right. If there's an army, that that's because good. there's an adversary. Right. That means there is a war. And you're only going to be on one side or the other. My joke a while ago about well, if you're not going to vote for him, who are you going to vote for? Well, if I ain't going to vote for one, I'm going to vote for the other one. Come on. There's only one or the other. Scripture tells us we can't be for two masters. Nope. Right. That's right. If we're not for him, we are against him. Right. Amen. That's it. Thank you, Jesus. But God doesn't leave us in the gutter to just live there in our field. He gives us the power through that Holy Ghost to transform our lives into what he needs it to be, into a plan that he's going to have. Starting back in verse 9, it says, But as touching brotherly love, while we're on this subject, let's, talk, let's touch on brotherly love a little bit. Ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Come on. Yes. And indeed, ye do it toward all brethren, all the brethren which are in Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. Come on. And that ye study to yes. be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we Come commanded on. you, that ye may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that ye may have lack of nothing. Come on. Yeah. And then basically what they're saying right there in the last couple of scriptures was there's more to being a a Christian. You know, that was the hit word for a long time to say that you was one. Mm -hmm. But there's more to being a Christian than simply coming to church. That's being right. Being in the service, reading your Bible, praying. There's more to it than that. Being a Christian is being responsible in all areas of your life. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And finding ways for God to get glory in all areas of our life. You wonder how well, how does that make sense, Brother Matt? Well, it's, it, it's hard to be an effective witness to anybody if they don't respect you. 
No, 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 no. I understand. Yeah, like what different people talk about how they run into people from their, their past life and boy, they just want to bring up all those old memories and they just want to talk about how bad they were and how this and how that. Okay, yeah, that they might be a little different because they under, they saw what you were and now they can see what you are. They can see the new creature whether they want to admit it or not and a lot of times I think it scares them. When they find out that they actually have the opportunity to allow God to do the same work in their life, it scares them. People have told me before, well, I just don't, you know, you're talking about giving God control and, and that, that, that idea of something that I can't see in control of my life just scares me. And I said, well, that's what faith is. And your faith comes by hearing the word of God. So if you're not hearing the word of God, if you're not going, so going to church is an important aspect, yes, but it's not all it is. Brother Ray was talking the other night. He said, that, you know, hey, as far as Holy Ghost, they talk about Holy Ghost a lot in these verses tonight. Just because I'm talking about Holy Ghost, I'm not talking about shouting every single service. I'm talking about something living inside you. Come on. Right. That every day it controls your responses. It's what helps you resist those temptations that the devil's throwing at you. Trying to do it on your own in physical ways because there's nowhere you're going to run to that you can get far enough away from the devil. His reach is going to be there. He's going to find something to throw at you. No matter what you may think can happen, no matter what you might can do, no matter what you might turn off, he can get into your mind. So we've got to have that Holy Spirit, not just as our ticket into heaven, but as our driver's license to get through this world. <clears throat> knowing there's an effective way to be a true Christian. Sunday morning, he mentioned it. Living that life of control. You know, we read a while ago in, in, in verse 4 when it said that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel Come on. in sanctification and honor. Come on. Know how to control yourself, control your impulses. Yeah, I know they mentioned fornication a while ago. I, I know that that's what a lot of preachers like to go. They go to premarital sex. They go to fornic They go to all these different things. But hey, why always go for the big stuff every single time? Sin, sin. We also talk about gossip. We also talk about lying. We also talk about, we're talking about, that's why it says study to be quiet and do your own business. <laughs> you know, I pick at Rebecca all the time. She's the nosy one. <laughs> Come on. She was from me to Brother Larry the other night over there at the house. Me and Sheila was in the kitchen. She was way over there in the den. We kind of carrying on a kind of, not a hush-hush tone conversation, but we ain't talking all that loud. And I asked a question, and before Sheena could answer it, Rebecca did. <laughs> and I looked up, and I said, what you in there listening to our conversation for? That got you in trouble now. Now you know too much. You know, and then get her out of that real bad and it was hilarious there for a few minutes there. But knowing that we can, that life of control, okay, God, you know, you, I'm going to let you hold on to this. Control your own self. Live your life in a holy and an honorable way. Our impulses, you know. I've gotten over here lately. I like Diet Mountain Dews. Would it be healthy for me because they're diet to drink a 12-pack of them a day? No, they're not beer, but is that healthy for me? No. So just kind of looking into different everything that we can do. Now, it seems like, good Lord, what's back? We got to look at it. We got to hold on to God. We got to do it and everything. We got to, I got to pray and ask God before I could drink a soda. What in the world are you talking about? What's going on? But look, we go on into verse 13. And for the rest of this chapter, it does seem like it's a little odd. But with Jesus resurrecting, the hope that we now have to help us with these things, mm -hmm. to get us through this life, to know that our labor does not have to be in vain. It's going to be funny to sit back and get to laugh at the devil to see all the work that he's tried to put in and tripping you up was all in vain because you stood the, you stood the test. You've made it to the finish line. And the finish line may not be 
The second coming, it might be death. So verse, starting with verse 13 and finishing the chapter up, it says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, talking yes. about those that have died, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we do, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, God told us this, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. To a lost sinner, death should scare them. I've told y'all about how many the uh, offenders we get coming in. Brother Mitch was probably saying them. Boy, big letters right there across their chest. They'll have a tattoo. Only God can judge me. And I want to ask every one of them, that doesn't scare you? That's the ultimate judge, buddy. That's, right. That's the one that knows for a fact everything that you've done. You may have wiggled out. You may have had somebody lie for you and give you an alibi. You may have gotten out of some things as far as man is concerned in this life. But guess what that judge knows? All of it. Everything. He knows the very thoughts that you thought of. He knows the very actions. He knows it all. So death to a person that is lost should, it should scare them to death. But it doesn't have to be a scary thing to a believer. It can be something that we can comfort one another in. That it's not a goodbye, it's a see you later. There's an opportunity. Because when God has that power, and he, Him dying on the cross, He sent that power through to us. We have that opportunity. We are connected to a person with the power through His Holy Spirit that can turn tragedies into triumphs. Just outright disasters, He can turn them into victories. He could turn poverty into riches. Boy, you ought to see everybody scrambling today, checking their accounts, because somebody spoke up and said they got their $600 last night. <laughs> you don't think I didn't run outside and text Sister Sheena and said, check our account. You yeah. crazy. I did too. <laughs> that, hey, cool. That is what it is. But it's monetary here on this earth. I'm talking about riches that you can't count. Come on. Riches that we can't limit. Riches that we can't put a number on. He can turn pain. He can turn suffering into glory. He can turn defeat you, into victory. So people that just feel that want to say that they're just too far gone, that they're just they're just too weak, they're just too this, they're just too that. Their sins have been too great. The only thing that the Lord said he can't forgive is blasphemy. And there ain't but one way. You've got to have the Holy Ghost in order to blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Right, right. So a lost unbeliever out there in the world today that's hungry for something and you trying to witness to them, that's just trying to have a cop out to get you to leave them alone. So we've got God on our side tonight with his unlimited power. We can have the help to get through this life. We can have the help to resist the devil. We can have the help to walk a life that will be pleasing in God's eyes. We can have the help to continue us right on into our new home when he comes back. Whether we see him in death or whether we see him in rapture, it doesn't matter. We don't have to be afraid. So I hope something was said tonight that made sense and uplifted Oh, and, and, and just you, I hope somebody just got something out of this deep down in my heart. I hope Jesus. you did. Good. I'm going to close Jesus. now. I'm going to ask if everybody will let's all stand. And we'll get Brother Ray if he'll dismiss us with prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, let us once again thank you, God, for your goodness to us.